Good morning. Welcome. Welcome all newcomers, members, and friends to this morning's worship service here at Central Unitarian Church. My name is Tom Lupfer. CUC is an inclusive community which embraces diversity and identity, expression, and spiritual belief. Many of our members and friends find inspiration, hope, and renewal with us, and we hope you will find something meaningful about our service today. If you're visiting us here in person, please make sure to say hello to one of our welcome hosts, usually over here by the table. And if you're visiting online, we invite you to sign the guest book by providing us your name and contact information. And a link for that is now appearing in the chat at the bottom of your screen. We gather this morning as a community of all ages. We believe children and youth are an integral part of our community and the future of our faith tradition. We welcome all with open hearts. We recognize that our bodies, minds, and spirits require ways of paying attention that differ from person to person. And we strive to support each other by creating a space that works for as many of us as possible. Silence and stillness are not our goal. And instead, we aim to support each other in enjoying our time together as a community. We are grateful for all those who helped make today's service possible, including the Reverend Andre Cornelia Mall, music director Matt Anderson, Phil and Jim on tech, and uh, this morning we have greeters from our youth group. Uh, thank you to Noah Hartman, Amy Usatine, and Quinlan Craft. We invite you all to stay after service for coffee, conversation, and connection here. And as we prepare this morning, we ask anyone here in person, make sure your phone is off, except me or else we can't keep going. And for anyone online, we encourage you to have your own chalice ready as we light our chalices here in the worship space. This morning's announcements, here we are. There will be a discussion after service today. Reverend Andre will be leading a conversation here at noon in the sanctuary. The discussion topic will be the UUA Article 2 Study Commission Report which is also the topic of this morning's service. Please join us for this opportunity to dive deeper into the topic. Following the model of our popular monthly soup lunch, Reverend Andre is going to be offering a new monthly soup dinner. This dinner provides another opportunity for some of us to gather in a small group setting and just enjoy a homemade soup dinner and discuss the monthly theme. This month's dinner will be this Wednesday, February 8th at 7 p.m. in the Kitchen Annex. And next week is our All Ages Love Service. Join us for the All Ages Love Service where we celebrate individuals from black history who exemplify love in action. After service, the Family Faith Formation Program is sponsoring a coffee hour and an activity to help build a temporary mural in the hallway to celebrate Black History Month. Everyone is welcome to join. And now let us more formally begin our gathering together. Are we, oh, you've got, uh, I'm just going to pass this off. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. A uh, couple extra things. The um, CFA trunk donations. We're gathering food on the first Sunday of every month for the Center for Food Action. If you brought some donations today, the Hoffmans will have their trunk available after service to help gather everything and then bring those donations over to the Center for Food Action. So thank you for helping us collect that. The other announcement I wanted to share is, as many of you know, our Director of Family Faith Formation, Allie Christopher, has been out for some time caring for her four-year-old son who had a medical condition that she, um, that they desperately needed to pay attention to over the last couple months. Allie uh, has, is going to remain on leave through the remainder of this congregational year. Um, but through conversations with her, we uh, looked to hire somebody for fi the five months between now and the end of the congregational year to get us to, um, through the end of the year and keep our religious education programming up and running. And I'm proud to announce that the person who has um, applied for and accepted that position is our own Amory Hartman. So thank you, Amory. She's in the back. Um, 
CUC does have a policy of not hiring members, and there's a variety of reasons for that, and uh, the executive team felt that we uh, could make an exception in this point because it was a short-term limited situation where we're trying to get to, to the end of the year, and Amory brings tons of experience uh, with our RE program and beyond, so we're grateful for that. Welcome, Amory. So now, let us move more deeply into our service. Let us turn to each other and please take a moment to greet those near you. So as you may have heard in the announcement, the uh, focus of today's worship service is the Unitarian Universalist Association Article II Study Commission Report. Yay, a worship service on a report. <laughs> <laughs> Those of you that are here have a copy that's handed to you. Um, we'll reference parts of that throughout the service, and there's a discussion afterwards, as uh, Tom said. Those of you online, we're going to be putting a link to that in the chat a little later in the service, so you have access to it, too. I know this is a report and it's a very technical and I'll get to aspects of it to explain it. This whole service helps explain it. But I really want to emphasize that what we're really taking time to do today is to celebrate our wider Unitarian Universalist faith tradition, specifically analyzing the words that we use to describe our values and our sources of inspiration which most commonly for many years now we have referred to as our Unitarian Universalist principles. The language that we currently use and which many of you are familiar with as you use was actually adopted in 1985. And that, that time there were a revision of principles that had been written 24 years earlier in 1961 when the Unitarians and the Universalists came together. And now, nearly 40 years after that 1985 language was adopted, our association is again examining and um, considering changes to this language. And this is important because one thing we know about us as Unitarian Universalists is we are a living tradition, one that is always evolving and always understanding the world and the people we serve and ourselves in a new and different way. So today, that is a big part. That is the heart of what we are celebrating us as a living tradition. We are a living tradition connected to and informed by our past, but not confined by it. We are a living tradition inspired to seek deep truths in many traditions, not insisting that we hold one truth. We are a living tradition with faith that the healing we bring about in this world will usher in the world to come, the world we dream about, heaven on earth, beloved community, a world that works for all, not a faith of judgments and rules and ideas best left in the past. We are a living tradition, working to widen our circle of inclusion, building bridges of compassion, not walls of hatred and separation. We are a living tradition, composed of a people holding a wide spectrum of beliefs, experience, and talents, brought together by shared values, brought together by love. Join us. Come. Let us celebrate all that we have to offer.
And now please join me in our chalice lighting. The words are printed in the order of service. We light this chalice to remind us of our dreams, to nourish our heart, mind, and spirit, to work towards a better world for all, to embrace the whole of our human experience, to honor our past and the gifts of the present, to create a community where each of us may find healing, transformation, and hope. And now, please join me in singing our opening hymn, number 1058 in the Teal Hymnal, Be Ours a Religion. Matt will play the whole song through once, and then we will sing it twice. So as I mentioned earlier, the Unitarian Universalist Association is studying our principles and sources and considering potential changes to them. And our principles and sources are actually laid out in the bylaws for the Unitarian Universalist Association, which is the wider association that supports all UU congregations. So the commission, there was a commission that was charged with a review and is recommending changes to Article 2. I don't want to start by talking about bylaws in a technical, legal way. I want to start with a story. I want to tell the story of these bylaws. I know that sounds weird, <laughs> like having a service about this report. But bylaws, after all, just they're, they're ideas, right? And as UU theologian James Luther Adams once wrote, there is no such thing as the immaculate conception of ideas. They don't just miraculously appear. They come from somewhere. And so I want to examine this story. I want to tell the story of the ideas that fed us into where we are today and how that plays into our living tradition. And at certain points in this story, you may want to look at the current sources and principles. They are. Um, in front of our gray hymnal if you want to look, or on the report that was sent out, and also will be in a link in the chat. Uh, they're on page 17 of that handout. And so I'm going to talk about where these principles started. And it's actually a long, long story that goes all the way back to roots in Europe. So we're not going to go to the very, very beginning of the story. We're, we're going to start somewhere towards the beginning, but we're going to start when those roots, those seeds, found their way to North America. And we're going to begin our story in the 1620s, as Puritans came over from England. They were part of the English Reformation, which was separated from the Catholic Church. And these Puritans that came over here practiced congregationalism. 
which was a form that recognized the autonomy of the local church over the authority of a higher organizational power, such as the church. So if you think of the fact that they were reacting against this hierarchical Catholic church, it was pretty radical for them to say, our gathered body, our congregation, that, that is where the authority lies, not in some, some higher church. But as these little congregations, churches started forming in New England, they started to say to each other, well, what do we mean to each other? Are we just these complete separate entities? Or do we have things in common with each other? And so they got together and they wrote something called the Cambridge Platform in 1648. And what this document did was set out some of those things that were in common. They basically said that um, they gathered in churches by covenant, that uh, there was a need for churches to counsel together and support each other, but they really upheld that autonomy of the local church. And the church had specific rights, like the right to call its own minister. And they said there is no greater church than the congregation. So hopefully some of you that have been you used for a while, this sounds, this sounds familiar, right? Um, we, we've inherited these seeds um, from these Puritan Congregationalists. And it was out of this structure in New England that a variety of theologies started to emerge. And we flash forward a little bit to the early 19th century, and along came a preacher named Reverend William Ellerly Channing. And Channing was preaching a theology of rationalism, of saying that we, we can use our rational minds in our religious practices and, and make decisions. And this is really important. And it's important for us to be the best person we can be, to improve our character, <clears throat> and that we should engage in social issues of our time. He was engaged in abolition. People started calling Channing a Unitarian to try to describe his particular theology. And they were, they were referring to some of the roots of what he was doing that, that went back to Europe. But as with many individuals who end up starting denominations, Channing was not looking to like start a Unitarian movement. He was just a preacher. Um, but soon more people started to adopt this same mindset as Channing. And Harvard Divinity School, which was actually founded by Puritans, installed a Unitarian minister as their president. And Harvard started cranking out these very liberally-minded ministers who were preaching much of the same things that William Ellery Channing was. So as a result, more and more ministers graduated from Harvard. They're going out to these congregations, and more of them have this Unitarian message coming out of them. And what seems somewhat reluctantly, Channing decides to help be part of organizing them into a movement and calling themselves Unitarianism. So in 1825, they formed the American Unitarian Association. And again, they use that congregational model of saying that there, there is no, the Unitarian Association doesn't have authority over these congregations. It's an organization that helps us articulate who we are together and support each other as independent congregations. Because of the openness and freedom of Unitarianism, from the beginning, our moment ha movement has actually struggled to define itself. And it's, it's shifted as new influences come in. So the next generation after Channing includes some individuals which are now associated with the Transcendentalist movement. Many Unitarians and former Unitarians and their associates were part of this movement, and it was deeply influenced by looking at world religions, which was, was radical. Even, even Channing didn't quite like this, because they were saying, beyond Christianity, you can find inspiration in nature, in yourself in world religions. So these are individuals like Ralph Waldo Emerson, who actually left Unitarianism because he found it too constraining um, and was a big part of this movement 
or Henry David Thoreau, who also was born in a Unitarian church but resigned his membership for very similar reasons. And then there were also ministers, uh, such as Theodore Parker, who wrote the words to the hymn that we just sang, who was also uh, part of the transcendentalist movement. So as these influences such as this began to influence Unitarianism, again, we, get, we, we develop a point in our history where we're struggling to define who we are. And actually in the late 19th century, about 1865 to 1864, there were there was a more liberal branch of Unitarians who questioned the need for creedal tests in order to be Unitarians, and some who even radically suggested you didn't need to be Christian to be Unitarian. And then there was a more conservative group of Unitarians who would fear that if we moved our definition beyond Christianity, what, what would be our core? What would we have left? And this actually almost pulled the denomination apart. And they eventually moved beyond that. And, and as we know, as modern Unitarian Universalists, Christianity is one of our sources, but we're not specifically a Christian denomination anymore. So we, we moved beyond this. And at that time, there was an individual named William Channing Gannett, so Chan Channing was his godfather, hence he was named after him. And he was on the liberal side that felt we should move beyond just Christianity. And he wrote a summary of things commonly believed by us. He said they include freedom, fellowship, character, and service. And so this is another moment of stopping to go, okay, if we don't define ourselves as Christians, how are we defining ourselves? And, and Gannett's really putting forward some things that are saying we have specific values as Unitarians that we're putting forward. And I should say that at the same time, there's a, another Congregationalist movement called the Universalists, uh, which we've talked about before. It's part of our name, it's part of our roots. And they grew up in a very similar fashion and they were struggling with the same thing. Are we just Christian? Are we more than Christians? If we are more, like, how do we define ourselves? And both of these movements were very active in social justice issues of their times and being influenced by new ideas and other sources from around the world. Till eventually these two denominations decided they had more in common than they had differences. And in 1961, they merged. And at that time, when they get together, they're asking again the question, well then what, if we're now Unitarian Universalists, what makes us Unitarian Universalists? And so they wrote a set of principles. Um, there were six principles, and I'm not gonna read all six here, but um, I'll read a couple things, such as, uh, to strengthen one another in a free and disciplined search for truth as the foundation of our religious fellowship, to cherish and spread the universal truths taught by the great prophets and teachers of humanity in every age and tradition, summarized in the Judeo-Christian heritage as a love of God and love to man, and to encourage cooperation with men of goodwill in every land. So remember, this is 1961, and one of the things you may notice about the language is it says a lot about men, but well, there were women around in the movement. There were women ministers, there had been women ministers since the 1800s, but they'd been struggling to even get attention. Um, and obviously, women were a big part of our movement. So as we move into the 70s and 80s, the women of Unitarian Universalism did not let this go. And specifically, the, um, the UU Women's Federation worked tirelessly for years for pushing for greater equality in our movement. And one of the things that they were fighting for was less sexist language and more equality in the words that we use to describe ourselves. So they started pushing for a change in the Article 2 bylaws in our principles. 
Um, and while there have been, and that's what was approved in 85, and that's the principles that we're all familiar with, that we teach in our religious education programs, that we often have as part of our services. And there's been some tweaks since 85, but for the most part, that language, the principles and sources have stayed as they are. But now, it's the 2020s. And over the last decade especially, because this is a living tradition, um, the struggle to define ourselves continues. In case you haven't noticed, the struggle to define ourselves is just part of who we are as people. And sometimes it seems annoying because we're having meetings and we're having conversation and we're looking at language, but it's an important part of our tradition. We're constantly widening the circle of inclusion to help fulfill our promise of Unitarian Universalism. And as our current uh, UUA president, Reverend Susan Frederick Gray, wrote in a recent message in the mid-2010s, this ground began to shift again, much of it in response to, um, much as it did to the response of the women's movement in the 70s and 80s. This time it was the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement, the election of Donald Trump with his racist and misogynist campaign, and the urgent calls to confront white supremacy culture in our own movement. All of these compelled UUs to ask questions about whether our principles reflected fully who we are and who we need to be. So some people were calling for an eighth principle that specifically called out our work to be called to anti-racism and anti-oppression. Some called for broadening our first principle to include all human beings, I mean, all, all beings on the earth, not just humans, uplifting the inherent worth and dignity of, hum, of all human beings. They were saying it should be all beings. Um, others said, well, we haven't really done a great job with the human part yet, so maybe we're not ready for that change. Um, and there was also a call for changing to our sources, which cited the words and deeds of prophetic men and women. Um, and there are a number of us, trans and non-binary individuals in Unitarian Universalism that actually work to get that changed to say prophetic peoples, to acknowledge the gender diversity. And then there's those who said that, you know what, our principles and the language we use are too legalistic to use them as a way of really defining our tradition. And they've asked like, where's the poetry in these sources? We use them in RE, we use them in our worship services, and so we want something more. And then there are those that said, you know what, our principles really don't hold us accountable for anything. They articulate a wide set of beliefs, and they say that we covenant, it's actually written as a covenant, we covenant in the Unitarian Universalist Association to um, affirm and promote these principles, which has some action to it, but that's not a very strong language to say, this, this is how we're accountable to uplift, upholding these principles. So given all these conversations, the UUA said, okay, it's time. We're gonna have this commission and we're gonna look at all this. And so this is where our story ends today. This living story. And it's one with really no, no end. So it isn't really ending today, like I said. It's, this is just where we are, and it's continuing. It's a story of a people seeking truth and meaning and always asking what holds us together. It's a story of people asking what values they share, what commitments they're going to make to each other, and how do they uphold those values. So let us not forget this story with its rich twists and turns and all the contributions of our Unitarian and Universalist ancestors with the promise of our shared living tradition. A religious community is like a river formed from the many streams of our lives that meet and merge and flow to the sea. As members and friends of this religious community, we share our time and energy, creativity, imagination, and vision, our talents, skills, and gifts, and the streams of our individual lives to create a river that is both deep and broad, a river that is made of the many streams, sustains life, and refreshes the land through which it flows. 
But the river of this community also depends on our shared financial support that makes real our shared values and vision. We will now receive an offering for the support of this religious community and its works in the world. You are invited to give generously and joyfully as you are willing and able. We dedicate these gifts in the service of our mission to welcome all into a home of spiritual diversity that challenges us to become our best selves, to minister to one another in love, and to serve the greater community. Now we enter into a time of meditation to share together the joys and concerns of this community. We, we do this each week as a way of caring for each other. 
will begin with me reading joys and concerns which have been submitted in writing. I will then turn to those that have been posted here online and read those out loud. So I welcome those of you who are online right now. If you have a joy or sorrow to please type it into the chat. And then I will come back to this room and invite you all to share out loud the name of anybody else you're holding in your heart today. Following the sharing, we'll enter into a moment of silence and a prayer and a meditative hymn. So let us take a deep breath together to enter into this space together. Taking a breath in and out. This breath shared by living beings. <clears throat> Let us enter into a space of holy listening as we share and receive the joys and concerns for this community for Sunday, February 5th, 2023. May we hold all these joys and all these sorrows, both spoken and unspoken, in our hearts as we enter into a moment of silence. Spirit of life, spirit of love. As we live in this world of constant change, change which is part of the universe, part of being, part of living, we know that that comes with its ups and downs, it's new beginnings and endings. It's times of joy and celebration, and it's times of sorrow, heartache, and challenge. This is part of the beauty and the complexity and the struggle of living. We turn to you, Spirit of Life, as we move through these moments of life. Embracing those moments as we can, finding support and solace and comfort and healing where needed. Blessed be, and amen. Please go ahead and remain seated for our next meditative hymn. It's 184 in the gray hymn will be up here on the screen. It's one we don't sing very often, but it's our hymn this month, so we'll get used to it. Um, be ye lamps unto yourselves. And Matt's gonna play it through once and then we'll sing it through just once. In the uh, Article 2 Study Commission report, they have actually put in it some recommended language, which you will see um, in the report that has been sent out. 
And this new language is a rearticulation of the UU principles. And so Tom and I are going to read a draft of that proposed language specifically on the values and covenant. Values and covenant. As uni Unitarian Universalists, we covenant congregation to congregation and through our association to support and assist one another in our ministries. We draw from our heritages of freedom, reason, hope, and courage, building on the foundation of love. Love is the power that holds us together and is the center of our shared values. We're accountable to one another for doing the work of living our shared values through the spiritual discipline of love. Inseparable from one another, these shared values are interdependence, pluralism, justice, transformation, generosity, and equity. Interdependence. We honor the interdependent web of all existence. We covenant to cherish Earth and all beings by creating and nurturing relationships of care and respect. With humility and reverence, we acknowledge our place in the great web of life, and we work to repair harm and damaged relationships. Pluralism. We celebrate that we are all sacred beings diverse in culture, experience, and theology. We covenant to learn from one another in our free and responsible search for truth and meaning. We embrace our differences and commonalities with love, curiosity, and respect. Justice. We work to be diverse, multicultural, beloved communities where all thrive. We covenant to dismantle racism in all forms of systemic oppression. We support the use of inclusive democratic processes to make decisions. Transformation. We adapt to the changing world. We covenant to collectively transform and grow spiritually and ethically. Openness to change is fundamental to our Unitarian and Universalist heritages. Never complete and never perfect. Generosity. We cultivate a spirit of gratitude and hope. We covenant to freely and compassionately share our faith, presence, and resources. Our generosity connects us to one another in relationships of interdependence and mutuality. Equity. We declare that every person has the right to flourish with inherent dignity and worthiness. We covenant to use our time, wisdom, attention, and money to build and sustain fully accessible and inclusive communities. As I mentioned earlier, our current principles have been in place for 38 years, and there have been some slight updates since 1985, um, but they've been the basis for our religious education programming for all ages, worship services, welcome information. Some of us are familiar with this little card that you can hand out that says, what do Unitarian Universalists believe, and it has our principles on it. And for a faith tradition that is often accused of believing nothing or allowing its members to believe anything, these are, these are actual things I hear often, and I'm sure some of you do as well as you encounter non-UUs in the world, they are a way for us to describe who we are. And as I mentioned earlier, if you pay attention to the original language, they're written as a covenant between congregations. Because after all, despite debates on this topic and this path, we're not decisively a creed, we're decisively not a creedal faith, but we're a covenantal one. Broadly as Unitarian Universalists, we are a people covenanting together to affirm and promote our principles. 
So why, why change? We're changing because we're looking at potential change because we are a living tradition and our bylaws are a living document. Nothing in our tradition is set in stone. As a liberal faith, it exists as a reaction to more conservative religion, which holds fast to tradition and focuses on the past. And I've said this before, this distinction that sometimes gets mistaken when we say we're a liberal tradition. Yes, we have a lot of liberal-minded folks as part of our congregation, but we're not talking about politics. We're talking about religion. Liberal religions embrace change, our living tradition, and look to incorporate new ways of understanding. More conservative traditions turn more and look at the past. So as others have looked at our principles and examined how our tradition both is and is not living up to its promise, as I said, there have been, been calls to uh, change our, our principles and update them, to have a direct mention of anti-racism and anti-oppression, to have more actionable language that holds us accountable to our commitment, um, and to have language which sounds less legalistic um, and that last one is actually something that I think I've seen you, you struggling with for a long time, even if you're, you just love our current principles. Um, you'll notice that in many of our RE programs, we don't hand out the principles as written in our bylaws because they sound like bylaws. And so we rewrite them in ways that we can teach them to our children. Um, that's just one example of the ways that some people have struggled with our principles as written. So uh, our living tradition and the way we embrace change that I've been talking about so far, it, it is exemplified in a sermon by one of the transcendentalist ministers that I mentioned earlier that, it, that again did the language for that first hymn of ours, Theodore Parker. He preached a sermon in 1841 called The Transient and the Permanent in Christianity. And in this sermon, he was talking about the difference between pure Christianity and the transient aspects of Christianity. So he was saying that pure Christianity, pure religion from a Christian perspective was what Jesus said and did. And transient Christianity or transient religion were all the ways the words and deeds of Jesus had been interpreted by humans and turned into doctrine, doctrines, creeds, and rituals. That, that, that's all transient. It's, it's changing and moving throughout time. But often what happens is some of the transient things gets mistaken for the permanent, for a true religion. And Parker summarized that, that true religion for, for him, for Christianity, he summarized it in Jesus' words as love of God and love of your neighbor. And I think that seed is still there. That's why in some of what Tom and I are reading, you're still seeing that, that seed of love that comes from not only this, but also from our universalist side as well. So all else outside of love of God and, and love of neighbor, Parker was saying, is, is everything else is transient. And so he's, he's saying we, we always must ask, what is pure religion and what are the trappings which will change and evolve over time? Because that, asking that question is how we're going to determine what's at the heart of our faith. So obviously we're at a different place than Parker was in the 1800s. We're a more inclusive community that um, looks at sources beyond just Christianity. But we're still asking that heart question, that what, what is at the heart of our faith? And this is why we're going through this process now. And if we quit asking ourselves what's at the heart of our tradition, we risk falling into those traps of mistaking transient parts of our tradition uh, as its heart. The significant 1985 update of our principles occurred 24 years after the original principles were written, and now it's been 38 years. And in that 38 year time frame, the world has changed and our understanding of ourselves have changed. So the, the commission that's in charge of the study 
is following a careful process of review and input. And I'm not going to go through all of that here, but it's, it's in the report that was handed out on page 12 through 16. And when you review it, you'll see that this work, be this is not new. It may be new for our conversation here at CUC, but the work began in 2020. And it uh, included a review of both previously related studies, of which there are many, as well as gathering input from individual UUs, congregations, and groups representing those with traditionally marginalized identities in our faith tradition. And so the submission that you have in front of you was given to the UUA board just this last month, and it's the result of many years of work, uh, two and a half years of work, um, and it's suggesting some new language, but there's still process going on. So it's now time for us to review and digest this and have an opportunity to submit changes, which can be done at this point through delegates for the congregation um, to General Assembly, because the final proposal and the, some amendments to this um, will be making their way to our General Assembly this June in Pittsburgh. Um, so if you're interested in being part of that and being part of our team and a delegate for General Assembly in Pittsburgh this year, either in person or online, please let me know. And if that proposal receives a majority approval at GA this year, and, there, and if any amendments are accepted, the study commission will make any of those changes, and it'll actually then go back to GA next year, and that, that final uh, proposal will require a two-thirds majority vote to be officially adopted by our association. So as you can see, this is part of a bigger process. It's not just some people sitting in a room deciding we're gonna change the language of our principles, and, um, and, and that's it. You can't do anything about it. They're really engaging congregations and people throughout this process, and we still have time to do that as well. So I'm, I'm sharing all the technical aspects of this process, but at its core, the commission has been asking us, as you use these last few years, to consider questions such as these. What is essential to you as about being a Unitarian Universalist? What is essential to you about being a Unitarian Universalist? What language helps you describe the heart of Unitarian Universalism to other people? What is missing from our current covenants or faith language? And what must we do now to pave the way for the future of Unitarian Universalism that we imagine? So Tom and I read part of the, the draft earlier, and the full language again is in the report. And the shared values they articulate are up on the screen behind me here too. They include interdependence, pluralism, pluralism, justice, transformation, generosity, and equity. And most importantly, harking back to our history, including Parker's sermon, they point to love as the heart of these values. The report says, love is the power that holds us together and is the center of our shared values. We're accountable to one another for doing the work of living our shared values through the spiritual discipline of love. And one of my colleagues pointed out that uh, this looks like a flower. And one of the ways she thinks about it is, this is the flower exemplifying our, our values as Unitarian Universalism, and we're, we're like honeybees attracted to this flower and taking things from these values and spreading them out in the world. And I like that imagery as a way of, of thinking about this, this flower of values, if you will. So surely there is much for us to consider for this new articulation of our principles. And this, at least for Central Unitarian Church, is just a start, although I know there have been a couple of us who've been engaged in this. And if we are to engage in our living tradition, we need to engage in this process for ourselves, for each other, and for the future of our faith. So I encourage you to take time to review these changes, to simply sit with them and consider what they have to offer. Follow along with the resources that are offered by the Study Commission on the UUA website and engage in any dialogue we offer at CUC around them, including this afternoon after service. 
So I want to close with some words of the Reverend Susan Frederick Gray, who uh, in her recent message that I already quoted earlier said, seven years ago when I was beginning my campaign for UUA president, I approached the process with an intention to be open to the process while letting go of outcomes. And my hope for us as Unitarian Universalists is that we approach our discernment about Article Two with similar openness. May we enter our conversations with a spirit of curiosity, holding off attachment to outcomes, and listen with our whole hearts and to the fullness and diversity of voices in our community. May the process itself deepen our understanding and commitment of our faith. And so I'll ask you to rise in body or spirit to sing our closing hymn. <clears throat> This is 298 in the gray hymnal, Wake Now My Senses. And, sorry about it. We're gonna do the first three verses. Awesome, go for it. <laughs> We extinguish this chalice flame, but not our promise to each other. To act with grace, to hold each other in love, to serve this community and our world. This promise of the heart serves as a reminder of how we live together. May it bring joy to our collective lives. We are part of a living tradition. We are a people brought together by shared values, brought together by love. May we all fully experience and share all the beauty, joy, and promise that our tradition has to offer. Blessed be and amen.
Thank you, Matt, for our music today. Thank you, Tom, for worship associate. Thank you to Phil and Jim out back on our tech deck. And uh, for those of you that want to stay for a deeper discussion on uh, the, the report that was handed out, we'll start at noon here in the sanctuary. So I'll just come back here when you're ready to start.